Okay. Um, so we have some people signing on to Zoom. Sorry for all the delay. Um, you can see the goals, but I'm going to move on because we have a lot of uh, content to cover. Okay, so there are some current data management requirements. Um, the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Health Geometric Data Sharing, and um, the National Science Foundation. And more and more journals and publishers are also adopting requirements that you must have a data um, plan, either management or sharing. So we'll start with the National Institute of Health. So in 2003, they required that all grants over $500,000 are required to have a data management plan. In 2015, they released a white paper outlining what should be included within your data management plan. Um, but as of November 2016, it hasn't really been put into effect um, because they felt that it was going to be too time consuming for researchers. Yes? You have data sharing plan. Is, look, is there a difference? No, it's the same thing. It's just a different term. Well, so in your, you'll learn this later on, but a data management plan should cover aspects of how you plan on sharing the data. Um, and then. So while the NIH one hasn't really have uh, ways to enforce it, there is a strict NIH genomic policy which um, is on my other sheet. So any large scale Genomic data like GWS, genome sequencing, and gene expression data must be shared. Um, and it must be uh, written in a plan when applying for funding. And the sharing of the data must be no later than the date of the publication. And then the National Science Foundation also have um, requirements which began in 2011. Um, each division of the National Science Foundation was uh, allowed to write its own guidelines which allowed for discipline-specific elements to be included in the plan, but this complicated it for researchers. But most divisions provide example plans um, for researchers. And the white paper that I mentioned, these are the different areas they would want you to cover. They want to know what data you are producing, how you're producing it, um, what software you're using, what Methods are you using? Um, you know, how do you plan on having long-term uh, preservation, and how you're going to provide access to that data? Moving on to journal requirements. So these are some of the journals that have requirements. I'm not going to go in detail for each one. But basically, they want you to provide um, access to original study data or statistical code for the annuals of internal medicine. Um, the Lancet encourage authors to share any data, preferably translated into English, um, for others to use. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine has one. And those are just some of the individual journals. But then publishers as a whole also have requirements. So um, all of BMJ require a data sharing statement for all research papers. Um, they don't require that you share it, but they, they strongly suggest that you, they do. Then there's this International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, which has a data sharing um, requirement. And those journals who are part of this International Committee um, are following the recommendations on it. So some example journals um, are Academic Medicine, Athletic Training and Sports Health Care, British Journal of Occupational Therapy, Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, Journal of Dental Education, and JADA, JAMA, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, and Seminars and Hearing. Um, all these journals I mentioned I know are used by our programs. Um, for information, and then we also publish within those journals as well. Um, the publisher PLOS uh, is open access, but they also have requirements. 
all science journals um, that support uh, the scientific community. Um, also, before publication, large data sets um, must be deposited in an approved database with an ascension number or a specific access address. Um, Springer Nature, they have different tiers of requirements. Um, but only if the journal itself follows the type 4 policy um, do they require public data archiving for every article. And the type 4 requires all data sets be available to reviewers and readers. So you can see there's a lot of publications, a lot of funding that require you to have this new um, thing involved with your research. And then here's just an example table of that International Committee of Medical uh, Journal Editors and kind of explaining, you know, how long they want the, it to be available. Some have unlimited uh, preservation, some it's only a few years. So it just, it varies and you just kind of need to know that, you know, read up on the policies. So, you know, they want you to do this. Right, but what you know? What's the incentive? There are lots of benefits, but there all there are also some consequences as well. So I'm going to go through four examples of retracted articles um, that were retracted specifically because their data was missing or falsified. So the first example is a NYU researcher. They falsified data in three different papers and seven different grants. So um, they claim that their falsification was because their funder went bankrupt, so they lost it. And then they had to retract uh, multiple papers um, and that she lost the raw data so other people couldn't use it. Um, and then they also falsified by copying Western blot images from unrelated sources manipulated those to obscure their origin, and then reused and relabeled them to represent different experimental results. Um, the second example is a, a lab tech filled in data which was missing. So a reader noticed that a, a panel in one of the figures looked a little fishy. So the authors themselves did an internal investigation, and then they found that um, the lab tech manipulated the panels after re realizing some of the original data had been lost. In the third example, a journal pulls a paper with missing data. And a few of the figures, um, the author was not able to provide the raw original da data or any laboratory notes for any of the experiments uh, represented in the figures to explain or justify the results reported in the article. So they retract it. And then the last one is a New England Journal paper on sleep apnea also lost the original data and they had to retract that one as well. So, I mean, obviously you do all this work, you get, go through the effort to have it published you don't want to have your paper retracted um, just because you can't find the original data. So you want to avoid retractions. So I have two different studies um, that will shock you just a little bit. The first one was from uh, Kerner Biology. So they did a scan of 516 articles on a specific topic ranging from uh, publication dates of 1991 to 2011. So that was their, um, their study, which they used. And they found that um, all of those papers, only about 74% still had um, a working email address to contact one of the authors. And this was either provided by the article itself or by doing some online searching. They received 101 data sets, or 19% um, of the data sets available when requested. They were told that 20 or 4% were still in use, so they, those couldn't be shared. Um, and then 23% just confirmed that those data sets still existed. 
But um, from their calculations, they found that the odds ratio suggests that for every yearly increase in article age, the odds of the data set existing decreased by 17%. So basically, the older, older the article is, the more likely it is that that data has been lost and can no, uh, no longer be used. Um, and for the reason for losing data is either lost or inaccessible storage. You know, they had their computer stolen, it's located somewhere in their parents' attic, um, it's on a zip or floppy disk, but they no longer have machines that can read that type of media, so they can't access it anymore. And then another study by the America, uh, Medical Library Association found that uh, they were examining retracted articles within biomedical literature, and they had a sample size of uh, 235, and they were either indexed in Medline or PubMed or a Bridge Index Medicus, and their uh, publication date was between 1966 to 1999. And the majority were retracted due to error. 36.6% um, were retracted due to misconduct. 16% um, of the results going to be replicated, and 8% were for other reasons. And I have a feeling those other reasons were due to data loss. Um, while you know the majority were to error, it's important to note this because it just shows that all those publications couldn't be used by future research to expand on the body of knowledge. And of those 235 retracted articles, they were still cited an additional 2,000 times even after they were retracted. Um, they label in Medline that an article is retracted, but if you don't pay attention and you don't notice that, you're, you're still going to go on to use it. Okay, so now we're going to watch a short video. Um, so this is a three-part act of a data nightmare. In the first act, it began with a researcher requesting data from someone who published in, the, in a science journal. So when they first requested it, the author just kept saying, everything you need to know is in the article. Hello. My name is Dr. Judy Benign. I'm an oncologist at NYU School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Judy Benign. I read your article on B-cell function. I think that I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. I am not an oncologist. I know, but I think I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. Do you have the data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. What I need is the data. Will you share your data? I am not sure that will be possible. But your work is in PubMed Central and was funded by NIH. That is true. And it was published in Science, which requires that you share your data. I did publish in Science. Then I am requesting your data. Can I have a copy of your data? I am not sure where my data is. But surely you saved your data. I did. I saved it on a USB drive. Where is the USB drive? It is in a box. It is in a box at home. I just moved. But can I use your data? There are many boxes. So many boxes. I forgot to label the boxes. Hello again. Thank you for sending me a copy of your data on a USB drive. I received the envelope yesterday. You are welcome but I will need that back when you are finished. That is my only copy. I did have a question. What is your question? You might find the answer in my article. No. I received the data, but when I opened it up, it was in hexadecimal. Yes, that is right. I cannot read hexadecimal. You asked for my data and I gave it to you. I have done what you asked. But is there a way to read the hexadecimal? You will need the program that created the hexadecimal file. Yes, I will. What is the name of the program? Cytosynth. I do not know this program. It was a very good program. 
The company that made the program went bankrupt in 2007. Do you have a copy of the program? I do not use this program anymore because the company that made it went bankrupt. Maybe you can buy a copy on eBay. I have good news. You again? I talked to my colleague. She knew a person with a copy of the software. Then why do you need me? Everything you need to know about the data is in the article. I opened the data and I could not understand it. If you have the program you will find it is clear. Well, I noticed that you called your data fields SAM. Is that an abbreviation? Yes, it is an abbreviation of my co-author's name. His name is Samuel Lee. We call him SAM. I see. And what is the content of the field called SAM1? Ah yes. SAM1 is the level of CXCR4 expression. And what is the content of the field called SAM2? That is logical if you think about it. What is the content of the field called SAM2? I don't remember. What about SAM3? Is there a guide to the data anywhere? Yes, of course. It is the article that is published in Science. The article does not tell me what the field names mean. Is there any record of what these field names mean? Yes. My co-author knows what the content of SAM2 is, and SAM3. And SAM4. Can I talk to your co-author? I'm not sure. I would very much like to talk to your co-author. Well, he was a graduate student. He went back to China two years ago. Can I have his contact information? He is in China. His name is Sam Li. I think I cannot use your data. You could check the article to see if what you need is there. Please stop talking now. Okay, so three acts. First act, the, a researcher requested the data. The guy was like, I can't give you the data. It's on a USB drive. I just moved. There, it's in a box. I didn't label the boxes. I can't locate it. I don't, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so many months later, she um, was contacted by him again. Luckily, he found the USB drive, so he was able to provide that information. Um, he mailed her the USB drive instead of like transferring the data electronically. Um, and he made a point that once he mailed it, that when she's done with it, she needs to mail it back because it's his only copy of the raw data. Um, further complications was that the uh, data was in hexadecimal, so she couldn't read it without a very specific program. He didn't have a copy of the program anymore um, and recommended that she purchase it on eBay. Luckily for her, many months later, a colleague just so happened to have a copy of the program, um, which you can only find on eBay because the company who made it went out of business, so it wasn't available anymore. Um, and then in the last act, she finally gets the data, and she notices that the column headings are SAM, SAM2, SAM3, SAM4. So when she goes, what does SAM mean? I don't, you know, it doesn't make sense by looking at the data. He explains that his research assistant name was Sam Lee, and that, um, you know, those were his fields, so that's how he labeled them. When she asked for his contact information, he said he didn't have it. His name was Sam Lee. He's located in China, and perhaps he'll, she should, might be able to find his email address online and contact him to explain the data. So that little nightmare story was a lot of headache for this researcher. Um, so could you point out anything that you noticed where the author went wrong? OK, well, I have, I have it uh, laid out. Well, so the first began when she asked for the data. He published in Science, which I mentioned requires data sharing. It's also in PubMed, and he was funded by an NIH grant. So that also requires data sharing. Then he um, only had one copy on a USB drive. USB drives can uh, lead to bit rot, so he could have lost it if he didn't have it backed up. Um, the file format could have only been read by a specific program, 
which couldn't be located because the company went out of business. Um, the field names weren't easily um, identifiable by someone not associated with the project. Um, and he didn't have the contact information for the person who might actually know that knowledge. So all, those are all the nightmares you want to avoid. Yeah. Well, so it's mostly the new author, but it's also the old author <laughs> because he went the time to go through this research. He had it published. Other people want to build on his work and you know, increase his visibility, but he was so unhelpful that you know, he's not really helping out at all. OK. So now we're going to move on to solutions so you can avoid all those nightmares. Um, so your solutions need to begin through the entire data life cycle. Um, and we're going to learn about different aspects of the data life cycle and what you should do as a best practice. And before I begin with this, I just want to point out why, li why librarians should be um, your support system for something like this. And it's because we're uh, authoritative curators of information. We already help you with other aspects of research, like literature searching. Um, we have interdisciplinary communication skills. And we're all, we also have specialized knowledge of information organization. We already have the skills to apply to this. I mean, honestly, for me, data is just in a different format than a book. If I can deal with books, I can deal with data. So there's multiple components um, throughout the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to focus on all of them. We're mostly going to focus on the planning, the describing, the preserving, and just a little bit of the collection phase. OK, so to begin with the planning. So while researchers may just want to do research and they don't want to do any planning, I can guarantee you that having a little bit of a plan will save you hours of work later on in the process. Um, so because your funder may require it, a journal or a publisher may require it, um, you know, if you learn these best practices now, you'll have a little bit of understanding of how to do it and you know, save countless work um, and avoid that data nightmare. And of course, there's also other benefits. So we will have consistent data collecting because you're telling everyone on the research project, this is how we're collecting it, this is how we're storing it, this is how we're labeling it, these are, these are the, um, the ways to put it in there. Um, you're increasing efficiency of research um, by having clearly laid out roles and responsibilities. Everyone knows who's responsible for what and nothing falls through the cracks. You're adhering to your funder requirements or journal requirements. Um, this also allows for easy sharing later on. So if you have a clear laid out plan when a re another researcher wants to reuse your raw data, you can easily give them what they need and you know, not be bothered too much. Um, and then storage and preservation will allow you to quickly locate raw data if a question pops up or something needs to be reanalyzed. So the, let's begin with the key elements. So you need to know the different types of data that you're going to be producing and lay this out in the plan. Are you using exper experimental measures, observ observational model simulation, or do you have existing data? Um, what uh, instruments, equipment, or software were you used during your collection? Um, how are you going to organize your files and um, you know, the different folders? Are you going to organize it by um, I'll get into that later. Um, and once again, I'll get into that later. Um, roles and responsibilities. Who's collecting the data? Who's entering the data? Who's the overall maintenance? Making sure everything's there, everything's being followed as planned. And who's going to, and how are you going to transition responsibilities if a project member leaves or if a new person joins your team? For storage and backup, where and on what media are you going to store the data? And then what is your backup plan or your backup schedule? How often are you going to do this? Um, for access and privacy requirements, um, who needs access to the data? Everyone on the project or just like the PI? Um, you need to think about any ethical or privacy issues, any restrictions on reuse, um, you know, if there are proprietary information that you can't have it, 
or pay, uh, personal health information that clearly can't be shown? Um, are you going to use a certain type of open license for this? Um, and then what's your plan on sharing the data once the project's complete? And then, of course, the long-term preservation plans. Um, you can't just leave it on a USB stick and then expect it to be around for, the, for 20 years. So luckily, there's library support for you for every aspect of this. And then here's just some of the things librarians will be doing. Um, we can help, uh, with, help you write a data management plan or a data sharing plan. Um, we can help point out what the requirements are for your funder or journals if you do have um, that requirement. We also have lots of recommendations for tools and resources for developing a data management plan. We can help with naming conventions and uh, data formatting. Um, we can make lots of recommendations on metadata. Um, we can help find and evaluate a suitable repository for your preservation. And then we can also assist with locating data sets for you to reuse instead of creating your own. So we're, we're not going to be a ton of help with data collection. That's going to be on you. Um, but just a few um, best practices it, w with your roles already determined in the planning phase, you know who's responsible for what. And then you also want to have quality control over your data collection. You know, you want to avoid null fields. You want to make sure everyone's putting, if everyone agrees you're either using yes or no, or you're using a scale, or you have the, the, the correct units, all that sort of stuff. One way to do this is with a data dictionary. Does anyone know what a data dictionary is? OK, we have a few. Just in case. It's just a way for you to have a nice document that clearly outlines you know, a description of the field, what type, um, allowed values, units, and a text description. And it's also really nice to have a nice little example of what's acceptable to put in there. And the last thing is that you want to ensure raw data is preserved with no processing um, and document any steps you use to clean for analysis. That's if you're doing initial data collection, of course, you could always reuse data sources. So there's lots of data sets available because they're required through all the different um, federal grants. So you could always just use one of those to reanalyze for a question. And then your library support would be we can help with locating a data set to answer your question. We can help you set up a data dictionary. And then we can also make recommendations and tools for data cleanup. Citing data. So if you are reusing data, you still need to cite it just like you would any article um, that you use. So it has the same, um, same elements, author, volume, DOI, things like that. And it helps other researchers to find the resource as well. So we offer uh, lots of support in this area. We always have some of the things we can help with are formatting citations, fi finding those DOIs, using a citation manager, or if you want training on EndNote. Now, metadata. <laughs> Who doesn't love metadata? I personally love metadata. I was always fascinated by it. Um, so this is part of the described component of the data cycle. And it's basically just data about data. Um, there's three different types of metadata. There's descriptive, stru uh, structural, and administrative. Um, so the des descriptive metadata supports discovery and identification. The structural metadata describes how a resource is organized. And the administrative data helps in managing the resource by describing technical aspects, rights management, and preservation information. Um, of course, there's not just one type of metadata. There's lots of different schemes, um, which I won't go into detail. Um, but you want to make sure that you have nice, clean, thorough metadata to enhance discoverability. Um, and in that descriptive, you want to have nice keywords so other people can find it easily. Um, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, it's part of the documentation. 
Um, and then for your keywords, you want to use controlled vocabulary. There's different levels of controlled vocabulary. There's different taxonomies, the thesauruses, and oncologies. So your library support, we are going to be extremely helpful when it comes to metadata. We deal with it all the time. Um, so we can help by recommending what standard you should adopt um, and then also creating that metadata. We can review it to make sure it's descriptive and then also make suggestions to increase discoverability. And then if you need any help mapping terms to controlled vocabulary like MASH, uh, we can do that as well. So this is the documentation. I kind of jumped ahead with the metadata part. But there's lots of different aspects of documentation besides metadata. So it's your way of explaining the procedures and your project to other people um, so they know you need to make it clear to the people both inside and outside your research group about it. Um, and then this also gives you the option to explain terms um, to people who are outside your field and don't have that knowledge. So good documentation is essential for providing quality data for analysis. It assists when there are transitions in the personnel of the project. Um, it could be a backup if there's any allegations of misconduct. Um, it ensures all sources are credited. It also acts as a record to show that work appearing later in articles was actually done in the way described. And it makes uh, sharing data easier by explaining everything a researcher might need to know. So m here are my suggestions for the file uh, name formatting. They need to be consistent. They need to be descriptive. But they need to be brief, about 25 characters or less. Um, you should use underscores instead of spaces. Um, you should stick to letters and numbers and avoid special characters. Besides the underscore, um, you should use the NISO standard for dates, which is uh, year, 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 month, month, day, day. And then you should also include a version number within there as well. Of course, you want to keep everything organized. Um, my mentor for this summit I want to recommends that if you do a lot of publishing, that you have folders based on the journal name and then put everything related to that, those publications by uh, journal name so you can easily find stuff if you're asked um, follow-up questions. Some other options for file organization. Use a separate folder for every project. Use separate folders for each type of data. Um, use separate folders for each day if you're collecting a lot of raw data. Um, you want to keep it all in one location with regular backups. Um, it should be stored on one type of medium, which I slightly disagree with, and it should be in the file should be in consistent format when possible. And the data variables should also be explained in documentation. So it should be the name of the variable, its description, what type of data it is, uh, a date or integer the units of measurement, um, and any restricted set of possible values. And project workflows. So how, when, and who will do the work? When will the data be uh, reviewed for quality? And who manages the entire process? And the other aspect was metadata, which we already covered. So library support for documentation. We can help with the file naming conventions. We can help create a directory structure. We can help with determining frequency of creating versions. And we can make recommendations on choosing appropriate, appropriate file formats. Um, we always recommend open source because they're going to be around. You know, Excel may be widely adopted, but who knows if it's going to last for another 50 years. Yeah, so I mean, there's open source versions of all different types. Excel's a, a, profit, a Microsoft product, so if you don't have access to that, you're not going to be able to use it. So yeah, CSV. Um, so sharing data. There's benefits, but then there's also restrictions. So your benefits are to increase your visibility. 
um, within your fields. Um, you can facilitate new discoveries by allowing other researchers to use your data sets. Um, you'll meet your funding requirements as many grants and journals require it. And then you can also make these publicly available um, to, you know, contribute to the public knowledge. Of course, you can't share all types of data, so those are just some of the things. You can't share information about threatened or endangered species, um, personal health information, data involving children or prisoners. And the library support for sharing your data is to help you create a DOI or persistent ID for discoverability. We can help measure your citation impact. We can provide guidance on funder requirements for sharing data. We can recommend uh, repositories to put your data in, then also help you upload that data to the repository. Um, we can also help with creating a data paper. So a data paper is you just write a one page, usually brief, um, explanation of your data set, you publish it, and it's kind of like a second publication for the same process. So it's kind of a two-for-one deal. And then with that data paper, we can also recommend a data journal um, for you to submit that to. And we can also make sure your data meets all the FAIR data principles. So if you, as you're completing your project, you need to store your data properly. Best practices is to make three copies, one internal, one external, and like a drive. Um, you also need to create a backup schedule. You should include the version and the file name to easily locate it. Um, you should have some like off-site storage, like using cloud. Um, and then you should transfer data to a newer technology. Um, you know, don't store things on zip or floppy disks. Um, and you want to keep it unencrypted, which, and it's ideal because it makes it uh, more easy to read by you and others in the future. If you do need to keep it encrypted, then you should keep your passwords and keys um, in two separate copies in two different locations. So some of our university options for storage, we have our H drive, which they do regular backups. Um, then there's the Google Suite the Google Drive, so that has a terabyte of storage. And then they also have OneDrive, which is also a terabyte of storage. You need to contact IT if you want access to that. And then the off-site storage, like Amazon, uh, Elephant Drive, and Dropbox. So storage does not equal uh, preservation, and depending on your funding, you could have specific requirements for how long that retention is around. Um, so you could use that by, do that by using repositories. This is a key area the library can help in locating a repository, but there are a few things you want to think about. You know, is this repository reliable and safe? Is it well adopted by others within your fields? Um, you need to look into their policies on access and controlling access. Um, licensing, does it create a DOI for you? Um, is it indexed by a major search engine? Um, does it provide download metrics? And if there's any costs, either yearly or one up front um, for using this? Yes? Well, so part of the data sharing is making sure that you don't include restricted things like. My example is mostly with personal health information. You need to de-identify those people before you go and use a repository. Okay, so or, or if they don't want that data shared, then they don't share it. That's the other option. But if you're allowed to do it, we highly recommend that you do it. Well, usually that's shared if you're doing an article. Right, but people want the raw data as well for them to use and manipulate and other things. Um, the library support for um, storage and preservation I mentioned before to help you locate a repository to upload it. Um, 
explain best practices for storage and backup. Then we can also help upload the data set, um, you know, help. You mentioned the CHCs, they don't want them uploading it. We can help with that. And then also make sure the data is discoverable with the proper metadata and everything. And then just briefly, security and privacy. So part of sharing your data, you can apply licenses and waivers. Waivers, you relinquish all ownership or control, and you just submit it to the public for them to use. Um, and then you can also use open licenses, the Creative Commons licenses. That um, There's different various levels, which just let other notify, notify others what they can and can't do with it. Um, for your security measures, you might want to consider access control by providing different permission levels to individuals. You could have an audit log of all your data use. You should have authentication with strong passwords. Um, and also use secure data transmission um, like SSL. And the last is HIPAA which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's just removing any personal identifiable health information. Um, library support in this area is helping you figure out who owns your data. It's not always clear. Sometimes it's the institution. Sometimes it's the person itself. Um, we can provide guidance on what data points need to be kept private. We can recommend tools on how to keep the data private and also offer security best practices to avoid leaks. So that kind of seemed like a long library commercial. There are other research departments at our university to provide support. There's the Department of Research Support, which helps with biostatistics, scientific writing, and research uh, coordinating. Sponsored programs offer assistance uh, with your pre-award, award acceptance, and post-award. Um, and then each campus has an IRB to re review research protocols um, to make sure that everything is ethical and you're not subjecting people to unreasonable harm. Here are some useful resources. So the research hub is live now. There's a few fi uh, final touches. It's going to be on your left navigation under library services. Then there's the data guide, which has lots of tools and information about data, which I covered. Um, and there's the retraction watch blog, which I use to get our examples. 